I'm going to go, uh, just starting in the timeline, this, I, I, I told you before we started, this is going to be a little bit of a shorter timeline because there's not a ton of information, but it is very curious. I'll put it that way. And there's a little twist at the end too, that I can't wait <laughs> that I, I debated internally if they're related or not. And it was yeah. too, I debated the question if they're related or not too long to not include in the episode. I'll put it that way. So I'm not going to make a definitive claim whether I think they are or not, but I, okay. it's worth mentioning. So. I'll leave it at that. So Connie was last seen on October 2nd, 2018, when a group of hunters she was the cook for left the camp. So they were out at their quote unquote base camp on October 2nd, and they're going to go out and do a hunt. And this, this wilderness is so out there when they go Mm. out to hunt, they're gone a few days and they'll come back. Okay. They left camp. Everything was normal on October 3rd. So the next day, the hunters did have radio contact with Connie but they said they were unable to understand what she was saying. So they were getting transmissions mm-hmm. in from her, but it was garbled, staticky. They weren't exactly sure what was going on, but it was clearly nothing weird enough that alarmed them, I'll say. So, I mean, they were not changing their their agenda at all. In your research for the episode, do we know if um, that's common in that area to not get good radio reception or... Was that unique to this case, or do we just not know? I don't know that. I'm guessing just in my experience with radios, even good ones, in rugged terrain, Mm -hmm. sometimes if you don't have good line of sight or you're in a certain spot, you just don't get reception. I mean, that even happens with GPS. Yes. When I was hiking in the Canyonlands, uh, down in the canyons, my GPS wasn't working, which made it harder to navigate. Yeah, it can be rock formations if there's a lot of iron in the landscape. You know how it can throw off compasses. There's lots of things that can occur that just Mm -hmm. make your equipment go wonky. The hunters did return to camp on October 5th, and when they returned, Johnson and her dog Ace were both gone. So the search began almost immediately with the hunters on foot, and they searched the area. When they couldn't find her immediately, they actually called in the canines and started doing a... Uh, uh, canine search right off the bat. Okay. So they, they contacted the right people. Not long after that, the U S air force was called out with aircraft using the FLIR technology that we've talked about in several cases, as well mm-hmm. as resources from the Idaho national guard and the Clearwater country back country helicopter rescue team. So I, I think it's a mix of who it was and how, how connected she was that kind of got the ball rolling immediately on such a high level. And I think it's important to note that this happened in 2018. So we're talking modern technology, modern search and rescue techniques. You can assume these people are all highly trained in search and rescue. So it's not like some of those cases where we've talked about someone going missing in the 50s or 60s. Um, yeah, this was just traipsing a couple over years the ago. crime scene or, or traipsing yeah. over what evidence would be to help find them. Yeah, this was. They activated the right people right away, and they're all professionals, mm-hmm. no volunteers, stuff like that. And it sounds like the search got going pretty pretty quickly. Oh, yeah, immediately. I mean, obviously, we don't have the details like some of the cases, but based on what you said, it sounds like it started up pretty fast. Yeah, so, you, I mean, you have a, a very well-experienced person at a base camp with some ample supplies and everything who has the knowledge to hike, survive, and live in the backcountry that disappears. So it, it sent off some whistles and alarms, and they got the ball moving pretty quick. So Chris Atkins, a former colleague says it's, and this is his quote, it's reconcilable. You know what everyone is dealing with, with this, because like you said, this isn't some pilgrim's first rodeo. This is a woman who spent literally the last 25 years of her life. Most of them on foot in the wilderness alone doing her wilderness range work. And if there's anybody, anybody that has the skill set that positions them to beat this, it's Connie. So that, again, just kind of reinforces what we said is she's not only spent 25 years in backcountry, she normally does it alone. So she is definitely prepared for, you know, if something happens, she's prepared to survive for several days. I'm sure she's well aware of if something happens, you kind of want to stay in place. If, if, if you don't know how to get out of there or if you're injured. Yeah, she, she knows all the best practices. Yeah, because you're, you have a better chance of being found if you stay in place and don't, you know, if you, if you're, if you know the way out, you should try to get your way out of there. But if you're lost, you don't want to keep just walking around aimlessly. Yep. Make signals, make commotion, make sure people can see you, but you don't want to walk around because you could enter a previously searched area, things like that. And that's kind of what they're talking about is if you feel like you're past a point where you're not going to be able to find your way out, you need to 
you know, make signals, build a shelter, whatever you need to do. Yeah. So unfortunately, after several rounds of aircraft search and teams of canines with boots on the ground, nothing was found. And the search was called off on October 16th. So it went on for well over a week and a half. Yeah. Where it starts getting crazy is that in a stunning turn of events, about three weeks after the search was called off, Ace, Connie's dog, was spotted by a backcountry pilot Tuesday at the ranger station. So a guy, a backcountry uh, pilot was flying around and saw mm-hmm. the dog at the ranger station. And it was about 15 miles from the hunting camp where Johnson was last seen. Wow. So Nicole Sy- Sailor, that's the daughter of Connie Johnson, said the dog was very skinny but in good shape otherwise. Ace, and this is the dog, was examined, fed, and taken back out, but the search didn't yield any leads or results. So they're very hopeful, and they found Ace like, hey, let's get him well and take him out immediately, and hopefully he'll bring them to Connie. She said when she heard the news that Ace had been found, she was thrilled that he was alive. The fact that he was not with mom was very sad, and that's her quote. So a private searcher was hired by the family to take the dog back out immediately the next day to look for Connie. Unfortunately, this didn't turn up anything either. Sailor, who lives in Washington, D.C., and her sister, Christy Sailor of Creston, Iowa, flew out to Idaho immediately when they heard the news that their mother was missing. So this is going back a little bit. Yeah. It has to be very upsetting to get a little bit of hope after such a tragic event, especially when you might just be starting to accept the loss. And in, this is... This is uh, pretty neat because it it just reinforces Connie. This is an oral history uh, Connie recorded for the Selway uh, Selway Bitterroot Foundation. She talked about her experience in the backcountry after relocating from Iowa years before. And this is Connie's words. I don't remember really being afraid of anything. I'm a spiritual and faithful person and I kind of gave over my life to, you know, There's God taking care of me, and I know that, but I did learn to, and I don't remember being fearful. There were lightning storms, and there were creek crossings, and there were lots of challenges, things physically. But I'm naturally an impatient person, and this has taught me, since I was by myself, to be very careful about where you put your feet. You know, Connie, if you get hurt, there's no way anybody's going to help you. You're on your own. So it taught me to plan ahead about how I would negotiate this or that or how I would deal with the water supply or bee stings and that kind of thing. I just love being in that place so much. It just took care of me, you know. It's a pretty overpowering feeling to look up into those hills and especially being a flatlander like me, like I was, I still am in awe of the power of those mountains and the power of the weather and the creeks and the just the sheer hugeness of it and the fact that we're not in control of anything. So, I mean, that like goes on even more to show that she specifically takes way more precaution than even I do. And after doing this show, yeah. I take extra precaution now. <laughs> like <Yeah>. she like <laughs> is very, very, very calculated in her moves and what she's doing and understands like, hey, it might just be a creek crossing, but all it takes is one little mistake and you're, stuck with your pack in that creek and drowning. Yeah. No, that's a great insight into, you know, why she was a wilderness park ranger, why she was in that area. It gives you a glimpse into she was confident in her skills, but not, you know, she wasn't risky. Exactly. I know one of the things when you hike in backcountry hike is you you can be confident in being out there, but you you never want to underestimate the terrain or any of the animals in the, you know, the back country. Cause at the end of the day, you're not in control of any of that. You're just a visitor out there. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and everything is so powerful and she said it perfectly. It's, it's an overpowering feeling. And that's where like a lot of that beauty is, is in that just, you know, I'm just an inhabitant here. This is where normally it would end and it wouldn't be too crazy of a case, but this is where there's <laughs> kind of the bizarre thing I said, I'm going to have half the people probably think, that's completely dumb that you included it. It's not related. And the other half say it's totally connected. So on a bizarre note, Terrence Woods, who is 27 years old, was reported missing around 5.30 p.m. on the same day in the Oro Grande area in a very mysterious circumstance. Now, Oro Grande is roughly 45 miles south of Nez Pierce, so kind of far, but just give me my day in court, okay? <laughs> okay, I'm listening. So he was a production assistant from Maryland, and he was helping film a documentary 
on Penn Men Mine for a British TV show called Whitewater. At some point during this production, he just ran off into the woods for some reason has never been found. What? Yeah. So here, so Terrence's father said the referencing, they referencing the production crew thought he mm-hmm. fell off a cliff, but by the time they got over to over there, my son was 15 feet down the cliff running like a hare. So I said, what do you mean running like a hare? He said he ran so fast. I ain't never, I ain't never seen nobody run that fast. You can't get wow. lost out there because if you got lost out there, you're going to run into a road or houses. So he didn't just poof, vanish and disappear. No, he made it to that road. Somebody picked him up. So that's Terrence's father's quote. But despite yeah. an extensive search, no leads were obtained from the previous seven days of searching and no signs of Terrence were located in the search area or the expanded search area. Well, that's just plain bizarre. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So he just didn't say anything, turned and just started running. Exactly. Like dead, full on sprint, ran yeah. one direction and has never been found. Wow. Mm-hmm. And this was 45 miles south of where Connie went missing in roughly the same time. Correct. Huh. They're speculating. And again, this is speculation because they know what time he ran, but they're speculating, yeah. you know, it's possible it was around the same time. And this is where they potentially could be connected. Yeah.